Now, I know very recently we just did another video much like this, but if you recall, before the recent AMA and corner release, there was a big push back at Guild Wars 1 from the devs. We had that called Skill Pin Challenge. We had several substantial updates for the game after several years that mostly revolved around graphics and the way that things are rendered. And uh, even a sale on Steam that allowed a lot of people to pick it back up. If you go to Twitch lately, there's a ton of Guild Wars 2 content creators and people you haven't seen for ages back even playing Guild Wars 1. So, intermix with all of this Guild Wars 1 throwback stuff, they did do an AFC, ArenaNet Forum chat. If you're unfamiliar with these, it's where they take to the official forums and essentially host what is very close to a Reddit Ask Me Anything. It's a place where community members can ask the devs about pretty much anything on a specific topic. And over the next couple of weeks, the uh, employees at ArenaNet come back and try to fulfill good responses. So... As an old time Guild Wars 1 fan, I was really excited about this. I did a video announcing it so that as many of you guys knew about it as possible, would push interesting questions. I have to say I'm a little disappointed in the content. There are some really nice little anecdotes and insights, but the community didn't ask that wide an array of things, I don't think. And also, quite often, developers respond saying, oh yeah, I'll get this other guy from the studio to say something, and then they never follow up. Or they say, oh, I'll go find the stats on that, and then they never follow up. So, bit disappointing a lot of those kind of duds are culled from this video but nonetheless you can still see it's a very long video and there's a lot of cool things in there it's just i guess i had too high hopes as an old guild wars one geek anyway let's jump in and with one of the hot topics that will come up a lot of times over this uh, afc and that's of utopia Utopia being a known product that was in development for Guild Wars 1, the next upcoming full campaign after Guild Wars Nightfall, that was cancelled when the devs realised what they were trying to do with it was too big and complicated and that going to a sequel altogether would be more exciting. So, uh, the question comes from Alec8423. Uh, who says, what's going on with Utopia? The story we've been presented is that there were lots of ideas going around for what the designers wanted to see out of the fourth campaign. And that the more that everybody brainstormed, the less possible it was to implement the ideas without creating a new game. And so you went the route of creating a new game. I'm curious if anybody remembers some of the ideas that were the fundamental limitations, like ability to jump and ability to swim, are pretty easy to guess, but others perhaps not so much. I'd expect there'd be obvious ones. Ones and really that kind of small thing I'm curious if you're able to publicly share so yeah what a lot of this comes from actually was when the big reveal occurred in a 2007 printed issue of the magazine PC gamer and it was on the front page uh, anyway, so here we get a little bit of clarification from Joe Kims, who's the god of this AFC. Joe responds everywhere. He's brilliant and a uh, big fan basically so he says a big topic at the time was what is the newest feature that is as cool as Heroes that gets everyone excited for this expansion? So Heroes being the big landmark thing from Nightfall. That was controversial, I'll add. Uh, anyway, he says a great example proposal that did manifest in Guild Wars 2 would just be open world zones. It seems simple at first, but when you start going over the details, can you change skills or parties in a zone? Do the monsters respawn? How does loot work? How do quests handle it? It quickly becomes clear that to be fun and interesting... It needs a new set of rules that become a fundamental overhaul to the game. It's kind of amazing to think about uh, an iteration of Guild Wars 1 that was trying open world zones. And it's really funny because as a Guild Wars 2 player, when Guild Wars 2 came out, Guild Wars 2 felt completely different to the original because it did feel so large and magnificent and amazing. But nowadays, in 2018, when our mounts allow us to traverse these maps extremely quickly and they all feel a lot smaller, it's amazing how similar Guild Wars 2 feels to Guild Wars 1 explorable areas just because you get less players in those explorables and they feel about the same size and it, it's kind of crazy how that happened you can really see that they're basically just the same game the scales tweaked uh but yeah the idea of a guild wars one iteration of that guild wars 1.5 if you will within utopia that i think that is pretty new uh mike z uh, our current game director for what it's worth says the core feature that utopia was being built around was giving players choice through the form of quests and having consequences for the collective choices made by the community imagine a storyline that branched every couple of weeks slash months based on the total number of completions of one set of quests versus another. 
Which group of people did you choose to provide assistance to? Do you focus your efforts on the hospital or the orphanage? We were uh, While we were building out the story and associated characters, we started playing with the in-game tech more and more. It got to the point where we started to ask questions about things fundamentally associated with Guild Wars as a whole. I think the big turning point came when we essentially created a prototype for something like Shaymore that was a persistent map that had 50 plus people running and jumping around. Like Joe mentioned, some of the foundational code work was built around instances being the core PvE content, and as we started to try and break that mold, the tech hurdles started becoming larger. I know the engine programmers were also trying to push the boundaries of the quality of assets we were creating, but I don't remember the specifics there. Ultimately, it wasn't a single idea that pushed us over, but enough things popped up that we decided our efforts would be better spent on moving our designs into a new game. So I can add a few things here as well. When we did a ton of data mining, and particularly very early days data mining, there were a ton of different versions of Shaymore. Specifically that very starting area where you uh, arrive as a human, basically extending to shortly past the bridge, I think it was. I think some speculation was that those maps were also used for that initial trailer, way back when the original Guild Wars 2 trailer that had the transition from concept art into Divinity's Reach. But this does line up. I'll go even further as well. We've heard a previous story on this before, which was that essentially the campaign missions for Utopia would uh, unlock different outposts based on how even the broader community had completed those and chosen those missions. Uh, a bit like how the border would move in factions, except instead uh, that would gate like exploration and further outposts. And instead of being based on like a PvP alliance battle style thing, it was almost that was going to be like the core of the game. And uh, they they ran into various issues with the scale of that. And I believe what that basically turned into was the idea of dynamic events and the idea of choice in the personal story uh which were kind of big foundations of guild wars 2 but anyway there you go uh that's the first question it's about utopia which will come up several times more so uh yeah let's keep our out next we've got uh, a weird question uh what's the ashford J ghost now i will openly admit i was not aware of this or maybe once upon a time I was, but it's such a small, abstract, strange part of the franchise that it's fallen out of my head by now. Justine says, in pre-searing, when standing outside the Ashford Abbey, the Lakeside County, there's an untargetable NPC ritualist-looking spirit. When you go into Ashford Abbey, it's not there. Sometimes it spawns with a monk focus item. Uh, and the Prima Physical Guide listed it as a haunting specter and gave these stats about it. Uh, judging by its location, its species, its low level, its stupid high armor rating, my guess is it was a part of an introduction to smite skills, and more generally, both armor ignoring damage and two times holy properties, or that it was baby Moraga. Please, any more information? I mean, this is awesome. I think that the speculation Justine offers here is probably bang on. It would make sense that pre-searing would teach people about smite stuff, uh, specifically versus undead, uh, or that holy idea. Guild Wars 2 players won't be familiar with this, but Guild Wars 1 had damage types, and uh, some of them were quite impactful. Probably the most profound of them was, yeah, if you struck an undead creature with holy damage, you, did, you just did straight up double. Uh, Joe says, you know, everyone's always like, what is this ghost? But very few players point out that the so-called Brother Menlo, visible inside the abbey from the outside, has a completely different model than normal. Now this, I did know, guys. He says, even from a distance, you can tell his pants have a very different pattern. I've looked up the Haunting Spectre in the past, and the game has no details or scripts for it. Without finding the original designer who spawned the map, I'm afraid I can only guess blindly. It could be a vestigial piece of cut content, or simply flavor for the graveyard. Or the game is haunted. Uh, I reckon it's probably a bit of cut content. Uh, that would be my speculation. The mystery goes on, I guess. Moving on, we have your opinion on botting in Guild Wars 1. Now, this is a fascinating topic that, despite the length of this video, I'm still not going to touch on too closely because it's kind of a scary topic as well, but one that I'm really curious about. So, Delos X says this. Hey, I'd like to get into questions about the law, law development, various fun things like that, but I thought it'd be good for the community to ask this. So, this is a question, guys, on behalf of current Guild Wars 1 players, all right? How do you feel about botting in Guild Wars 1? Many players I've talked to have said that they're keeping the game's economy afloat. If there weren't bots constantly farming materials and gear, many items would become far too expensive for a large majority of the players to afford anything. I feel that if that happened, many players wouldn't play as much. Camadan certainly would become a nightmare if everything became so expensive. I still play Guild Wars 1 myself, and I love the game, the world, the story, everything about it. I'll ask more fun questions later if I can. Thanks. 
Now, most of you guys listening to that question will intuitively think there's something off about that statement. Gail Gray has not actually been a developer for Guild Wars 1, though. She's been in the company since forever. Uh, and she responds here and just says, uh, To your question, I'll leave it to more knowledgeable people to give a truly informed answer. But the thought that botters do anything of a positive nature for the game seems highly unlikely. I'm sure someone who buys botted gold or who works for an RMT company might say those things. But I don't see it. Um... And that's all we got. So the, the real situation here, as far as I understand it, guys, is most of the players who are still dedicated to Guild Wars 1 and doing it a lot are speed clearers. And that's like the bulk of the veteran player base outside of people looking back because of these recent updates. For a long time, Guild Wars 1's been in stasis where the active communities are those who are going for records in Doha, you know, solo records, low man records, or even full eight man speed clears beyond the speeds which we saw even in the game's heyday. But all of this practice and all of this meticulous planning and understanding of the game uh, and it's very impressive stuff for what it's worth. If you dig in the right corners of YouTube, you will find some really cool videos. Uh, it costs a lot of consumables. So in Guild Wars 2, your perspective of consumables is probably very different to what it actually is in Guild Wars 1. In Guild Wars 1, a concept is actually quite an expensive, uh, tricky thing to craft in, in, in a few ways. So it's the idea, as I understand it, that the bots are continuously generating concepts which wouldn't be able to feasibly exist and support the speed clear community as it is that advocates for the botting are going for. Now, there are ridiculous inflation issues and all kinds of other problems that have hit the economy based on years of botting that's gone unchecked. Uh, and there's so many different questions to this. For example, all right, let's say they do hit the bots. That would really tick off, I think, most of the genuinely really established people. But also, with things backed up so much, how much of a difference will it make at this point? There's a lot of strange things to think about with this one. But I think that's the underlying story. I just got, wanted you guys to have the bigger picture there so that maybe you can have an informed comment down below uh, if you've got your opinions. Or if you are still an active Guild Wars 1 player watching this video, I'd love to hear what uh, the other little insights are around this. Next question is from Work Lose, who says, One of the biggest mysteries in Guild Wars 1, for me, was the existence of the two loot chests in the Dreadnought's Drifts. There was also one in Ice Flow right outside Thunder Keep, Thunderhead Keep, but Wiki seems to have no information on that one. And then they've linked them. They say few people seem to know about these chests, and as soon as more people learned about them, they got removed. What was special about these chests was not just the fact that no keys were needed to open them, but also that they seemed to be able to drop every weapon skin that was in the game at that point, ranging from weakest to max stats. I farmed the chest in Ice Flow a lot and got a bunch of weird skins like Swamp Clubs, Dwarven Hammers, Axes, Crystalline Swords, but interestingly, the chest also dropped some Ritualist Foci before Factions was even released. So what was up with them? Were they ever supposed to exist in the first place? Were they designed and put in the game like that on purpose, or were they bugged from the start? So, just to put you all at ease, not the entire AFC is filled with really obscure questions like this. And this is a very obscure question. If these are about chests during just the Prophecies release, we're talking about a period of 12 months before even Factions came out. Back when I used to play the game at that point, I was mostly a PvPer. But Joe has the answer. Check this out. He says, I have no idea about those specific chests, but I would guess, based on the underlying system, that they were added by designers with good intentions as a prototype or as a bonus loot for reaching them, but accidentally went live in a too generous state. A story about a similar incident to make up for not knowing about this one was the Zaitian chest when it was in early development It accidentally got shipped to the live servers It had some of its loot sketched in but the keys weren't implemented so it was completely free to open Though you could only use it once per entry to Isle of the Nameless And guys I remember this! I remember doing this! He says you can imagine that once word got out a stream of players was entering the Great Temple of Balthazar And running across the bridge to the Isle Diligent tester that I am I was am among them After all it was important to check how many items the players could get right so I took advantage of the free loot for a few minutes while the leads discussed options. A live build to fix the problem would take half an hour or longer, so a rarely used option was deployed in the meantime, ordering the instant servers to stop making new instances for the Isle of the Nameless. When this happens, players who try to travel to the blocked zone enter a state where they are waiting for confirmation that their instance is ready before starting a loader screen, and they can't move. So the moment that this fix hit the servers, a crowd of loot-minded players got stuck on the bridge of the Isle of the Nameless, unable to move. It quickly became a dense mob of players chattering and joking about being stuck. One of the leads logged into the temple, walked over to the bridge and simply turned on his GM tag, which in Guild Wars 1 is a very visible bright green GM labelled above your character. 
Uh, to this day, I've never seen players exit a game as quickly as that bridge emptied out. No one was actually banned or flagged, of course, but I like to think that moment of pan panic was enough payment for the easy loot. Now, I remember when this happened. I was actually playing the game as this happened, unless I'm conflating this with another moment. But, uh, yeah, nobody really even knew what the Zaishin chest was supposed to be. It was just like this random thing. I think I opened it once and then thought it was too exploity and didn't go back. So I didn't see this thing with a bridge. Uh, but, wow, what a story. And that GM tag, I, if you guys ever saw it. it was like one of these really old late 90s internet tacky looking things with this silly animation ah oh, good stuff uh but there here you go no real answer on the Delgemore chest but hey uh, so next question is from Sunburst. Hello, exploring the maps and the beautiful world of Guild Wars has always been a favourite part of the game. And I would now love to use this unique chance to ask some questions that are related to my liking on cartography. Number one, there are several old PvP arenas in Prophecies that used to be accessible during the early days and are now inaccessible like Fort Cova. Have they been removed for the faction's release or would it be possible to make them at least accessible for exploration again? Maybe together with the other arenas where access is very limited like the arena in the Shiver Peaks or the Sunspear Arena. Even as an empty map, just for the cartography would be great. That's an amazing question, by the way. Fort Koga is quite profound as well in that it is one of the only places in all of lore that ever mentioned the coast off of the Maguma jungle. And it's completely inaccessible ever since that update. Oh, uh, moving on. They also say, what's the deal with those mysterious hidden outposts, like the one in the Domain of the Anguish that led directly to Malix, what they needed for and how many of them are there in the game? The one in the Domain of Anguish was the only one I ever knew about. And lastly, they say, is it possible to make some areas that are nowadays hard or impossible to reach, like Fort Aspenwood, the huge area behind the gate in the Northlands, or Vizina Square, local quarter for non-camping characters, more easy to reach and explore, or to add some underground areas, like the maps for Alliance Battle and the bonus mission pack to the world map, to fill it in even more, and to allow more exploration of the world. So I think that they're a bit hopeful for those kinds of updates with the game, but they are awesome questions, especially about some of the cut content. You know me, guys. I'm a sucker for cut content. Joe says, I don't know that we will have the opportunity to add ways to access the old arenas or change difficult to reach areas but i appreciate your interest in completing the map something i can ramble about is the mission outposts in prophecies the game was built around the idea that every mission was by in nature tied to an outpost in fact if i recall correctly the early vision was that the game was only outposts and missions without explorable areas you can really see how that kind of arpg design is in there right uh, the game maps are built around this premise at a very fundamental level, such that in creating a mission, you automatically create an outpost for it. Designers would later try different setups, like sending players from one mission straight into another, and with default settings, this results in there being a dummy outpost that isn't normally accessible for the second mission. It's pretty rare though, since most missions do have a proper outpost. And there you go, that's the explanation. It's funny how these things here seem so reminiscent of stuff going on in Guild Wars. We heard them talking about that whole throwing from one mission into another with Guild Wars 2. Uh, and that earlier message as well, where we heard them talking about... Uh, telling the instant servers to stop spinning up maps. That exact thing happened with Guild Wars 2 with the corner release when that bug hit the initial story instance. That's what they did, right? That's what they announced. So it's funny to see the similarities here. There you go. All right, so here's the next question. I've kind of cropped this a bit badly. I apologize. But the, the full question is, who came up with the idea for the entire franchise? Who Who's the brain that came up with it? Now, uh, members of us in the community know that ArenaNet was founded by three people. They were a trinity, and in fact, I, I believe the company's name before it was ArenaNet was actually Tri Triforce? Tr trinity or something like that? Anyway, uh, who, who was the big brains behind it? I've been wondering this since, like, forever, but because I'm a person who has lots of game ideas but can never actually develop one, but I do get inspired by a lot of games for my music production. Keep up the great work. Two responses. So Gail here, as one of the oldest employees, probably does have some sense on this. Uh, she says, good questions. My first introduction to Guild Wars came in the summer of the year 2000. This is five years before release, guys. She says, and as I recall, it was Mo who talked to me about the game's concept. I guess I've always credited him with the original vision, although I'm sure it was honed by the other three founders in concert with one another. As to which came first, PvE or PvP, what I witnessed in development was PvE first. But that's not to say it was conceived first or that it was given primary focus because I felt that both were being looked at with an eye to balance even then. Uh, there may be others in this active chat who can give you better answers, but that's my take on things from back then. Now, that's an amazing answer from Gail because... 
We'd always been led to believe that it was nearly an entirely PvP oriented game and experience and PvE was a later add-on. I wouldn't say tacked on at the last hour, but it was definitely a later add-on. Uh, I, I wonder what the real timeline is here because that kind of throws a bit of a spanner in the understanding that we've had up till now and that's kind of exciting. Uh, also, the credit that Mo was the, the, the big one of the three. I guess that's nice to hear for us in terms of that's the one guy that's still there at the company and was even a Guild Wars 2 game director for a while. Uh, what more it means than that, I, I don't know. And probably, you know, reality is always a very complicated thing. The other guys will obviously have done a lot of work that was crucial in its own ways and, you know. Anyway, uh, Matthew Medina says, uh, hmm, who also is an old-time uh, dev, says, This goes back quite a ways, so I might be speaking a bit out of turn, but my recollection is those early days was that there was no one person who had the main idea for the franchise. The three founders, Pat Wyatt, Mike O, and Jeff Strain, shared a lot of the leadership duties when I joined the team in 2003, and even then the whole team was given a lot of power to help chart the course of what the game would become. One clear inspiration for the whole team from the beginning was Magic the Gathering, in terms of how the art deck building was a strong basis for our core skill build system. I think as far as PvP and PvE goes, it was more the case that both were in development concurrently and our earliest team playtests tended to alternate between the two. I can still remember my first week we had a PvE playtest in a mission that we called the Iron Witch which involved our party of adventurers trying to scale an alpine mountain to confront the evil witch at the top. Though more often than not, we wiped at the first group of frost trolls who spam knockdowns. Oh, I want that as a fractal now. We've never heard of this, the Iron Witch. I really want the Iron Witch as a fractal. How cool is that? That's so badass. Also, nice to hear a, a little nod back to MTG there as well, which was always, always well regarded and understood as a big inspiration for this franchise. And you would never see or understand or realize those roots in Guild Wars 2 anymore, I don't think. But Guild Wars 1, it was pretty obvious. And uh, maybe bear that in mind if we do eventually see they have some kind of game, uh, card game for mobile they release as we will cynically joke about in the community they did once upon a time understand card games uh, well so there's even more comments here as well the devs really got fired up by this one which makes it one of the better threads in my opinion uh gail says oh matthew you mean my beloved snow peak i seriously love that map we used to do playthrough tests on it die and then there would be a pause as we all waited for someone to say go again and we'd be back at it over and over again it was a great map uh, question for you or Peter. I have to believe that Snow Peak became something of uh, something in the game. Do you remember what? I mean, part of the Shiver Peaks is obvious, but maybe one of the maps in that region. Peter says, well, I had joined the environments team as f as of factions, so I'm not sure what became of that prototype Snow Peak map. Maybe it inspired Spearhead Peak in the Southern Shiver, Pe Southern Shiver Peaks. I like the idea of that Iron Witch, though. Gale asks Matthew if he remembers who actually created it, and Matthew says it was either Joel or Lee. So, from us on the outside, we really don't <laughs> get to know too much more there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like Anvil Rock either. You know, that was a giant peak. Probably one of the most distinct ones in the Shiver Peaks. That was Northern Shivers. Uh, another tiny little thing comes out here, by the way. That's Peter Freeze who says that he joined around factions. That's not really that interesting, and it will come up a ton in this AFC. I just wanted to point out that I did a big video since Peter was fired recently, and I said he had been there for every product they ever released, and that was wrong of me. I'm sorry about that, guys. I guess he wasn't there when, fa uh, when Prophecies came out uh, because he was joining uh, the environment team for factions development, which means he was at the company during Prophecies' heyday, but not quite there when it released. So yeah, my apologies on that. I really wanted to get the facts right on that video and there's lots of little things that slip through the cracks. My bad. Next question, we're back to Utopia, uh, where the person says, what were the design intentions for Chronomancer and Summoner? What made them thematically different from the other classes? Any chance you can remember sample abilities? Was there any law that was developed before Utopia got scrapped for these new professions? Uh, were there any classes considered before you settled on Chronomancer and Summoner? Thanks for your time. So Joe says, I remember a little bit about this, but most of it was only in very early prototyping. So please take this with a grain of salt. None of the content for Utopia ever reached a true playable state. So this is very much my speculation from early designs that were sent to content programming for feedback. There was an iteration of summoner that would have been about quickly cycling their summoned creatures compared to necromancers who tried to keep their minion flock going. 
Summoners would end up using or combining their summons to bring out stronger or alternate versions to suit the situation. Combining, guys? That sounds good. He says a gimmick for Chronomancer that did make it to prototype was that they would have very long cast time spells, but instant cast that affected a spell while it was casting. So you might start warming up a four second spell, but then use a second skill before it activated to modify its effect at the end. Unfortunately, I don't know much about the class lore if any other classes were considered. Both classes tied to some of the themes for Utopia, time being losses in the mists, but I'm not familiar enough with the design to elaborate there. Uh, and Lindsay says, I don't believe we got to the point of really developing class lore for Utopia. Most of it was still early paper design when we cancelled the project. I don't recall us ever really considering any other classes than Summoner and Chronomancer. Uh, uh, you guys obviously can take what you like from that. I'll just add, as a bit of perspective about Guild on their idea for Chrono first sounds really fiddly and gimmicky and probably reveals a certain truth about Guild Wars 1 that if they kept going with campaigns as they were and double professions as they were, the game was going to get really unwieldy and weird and strange to sort of interact with. But also, as far as PvP is concerned, that sounds horrendous to me. The idea that the Chrono can just bait out and interrupt on something that doesn't mean anything or... I don't know, dupe people in kind of a really unfun way. I don't like the sound of it, but hey, there you go. I'm sure they would have found a way to balance it in the end, right, guys? Just like the Paragon, right, guys? Right? Next question, we've got adding Delgemore Arena to random arenas. So I like this one, and I, uh, as someone who played a ton of RA and Guild Wars 1 PvP, I feel for these guys. This is basically the uh, currently standing Guild Wars 1 community. There's also a lot of people who play RA. And so Witcher says, so Codex and Random Arenas have the same map pool, except for one, the Delgemore Arena, which is Codex only. Is there a reason why it's not available in Randoms? I know Active Development stopped years ago, but would it be possible to add the Delgemore Arena to the Random Arena rotation? Lindsay says, I believe that arena was considered more difficult for newer players and pick up groups to learn, so it was kept in the more advanced pool. So I'll, a lot of you listening to this won't really know what's going on. Basically... You had originally the random arenas, which was just hot joins. You'd go in and it would randomly assign you three allies and it would be 4v4s. Or you had team arenas, which was where you would have a pre-made going against other pre-mades. So the better players and the players who understood the game more and all of that would be in team arenas, really. While everyone else would be in random arenas. There was a cool interaction between the two where a team that got 10 wins in a row in RA would automatically be thrown into team arenas. But yeah, that's kind of the way it worked. Later, though, team arenas started shriveling and dying and dying and dying. There wasn't really anyone there anymore. So the devs got rid of it and replaced it with something called Codex Arena, which also was a failure in its own way, so nobody touches it. Now, the thing is, because you could assume the team arena players were better at the game, they got another map. And when it became Codex Arena, the Codex Arena got that map as well. But that map never came to random arenas. The thing is that at this point, everyone who's still in random arenas is going to know the game pretty well. And they would comfortably be able to play on that map, the Delgemore Arena. And I really do think that would be cool in randoms. Even way back when I used to play a lot, I used to want that in randoms. The concept for this map, by the way, is... It's deathmatch with priest revival, so every two minutes, I think it is, a priest revives your entire team. So you have to kill the priest, and then everyone stays dead and you win. But the twist is it's kind of a narrow U-bend corridor on ice. And ice in Guild Wars 1 means if you stand still on it, it snares you pretty heavily. Uh, and then it had sort of some higher ground around the outsides. Uh, it was an interesting map, and I don't know, I, I reckon that would mean a lot to Guild Wars 1 players who are still there in RA to see a new map after all these years. Why not? I hope that it's within scope of what Bill Fryce and SCW and co. have been doing lately. But remember, that's all in their free time, so who knows. Anyway, next question. HD version of Guild Wars 1. Are there any thoughts on redoing Guild Wars 1 with better graphics and maybe new content? There is 100 question mark years to play with for added story, seeing how reboots are a thing these days. SCW says it would be a lot of work in a lot of non-obvious ways. The current game downloads almost 4 gig, which is the largest file the old engine can actually process. So if we figured out a way to up the textures, for instance, we couldn't download them without rewriting the DAT file manager. I love it when Steven responds, because there was always like this slight hope for optimism there or like a very clear explanation as to why things aren't feasible uh, but he really does seem to sincerely consider what people say I would kind of just dismiss this all oh, HD version of Guild Wars 1 style questions I'd rather see a Guild Wars 1 philosophy based game in terms of gameplay but in another period of lore or even a new IP altogether before I'd want to just a, a remaster of Guild Wars 1 uh, but there you go you get a, a legitimate answer on that 
Next, we have this. Where do you go after Utopia? So, Utopia, the playground of the gods themselves, if I understand it right from Wooden Potatoes summaries. Was there any thoughts at all about where would you would go after that in the hypothetical next expansion? That would be Campaign 5, guys, which has never been talked about. So, awesome question. Or was it known that there would be, it would be the last expansion regardless? Could you even go anywhere after that? Would there be any way to top that? To me, it feels like one of those very dangerous places to go because the risk that everything after that will seem uninteresting and normal. How would you have handled that? Did any of this factor into the decision to scrap Utopia in favor of Guild Wars 2? Don't get me wrong. I would have still loved to see and explore the place and find out more about the story there. I really like this guy's question. I think there's a valid uh, things to consider. So Joe here opens with this. He says, I don't know where that Playground of the Gods line would have come from. It doesn't sound accurate. It is accurate, Joe. It's a very recent comment we saw from the devs last time we were talking about developer comments uh, on the topic of Utopia. Maybe just a couple of months old. Get with the times. Uh, anyway, he says, I don't think there was a creative risk in not being able to top it. Players destroyed a god in Nightfall, but I, the North, was still able to tell its own compelling story at a different cosmological scale. Uh, scale. There were always vague plans for the next expansion being pitched while one was in production, and sometimes finding their way into the game as foreshadowing. Nightfall had some allusions to Utopia, and Utopia would have had allusions to another expansion. Some concepts for another expansion were integrated into Eye of the North and Guild Wars 2. The Norn and Coden, for example, tie back into very early ideas for a frozen Northland-style expansion. Uh, and so that last little bit's a very, very, very cool anecdote. We know this about them seeding the upcoming expansions. They even talk in this AFC in a very similar thread that I won't give to you about how the Red Iris flower could have been uh, an allusion to Utopia because we now know that Gwen was going to be in Utopia. Uh, and several little things like that. If you even think about how the way that the summoner works and building constructs and creating things in the mists, and then you look at the backstory of Raza in Nightfall, there, there's tons of it. You've got Baltec there. Yeah, that would have been very, very cool to see. It's a shame no other dev responded here because uh, I think that would have been very fun to hear about Campaign 5. It's probably really silly to think about, though, since Utopia itself was so uh, thin on the ground, but there you have it. What were the original plans for the rest of Guild Wars Beyond? Just to be clear, Guild Wars Beyond is the original game's version of Living World. The devs announced Guild Wars 2 went away from development from Guild Wars 1 en masse except a few people. And that live team pushed out enormous amounts of awesome content with very little to work with. It was known as Guild Wars Beyond. It covered a civil war in Krita. It covered political change and upheaval in Cantha. It covered a wedding and uh, the stuff with the Ebon Vanguard and Gwen and Kieran, the grand great-great-grandparents of Logan Thackeray. All of that stuff was really good. Guild Wars Beyond. Now, we did hear there was going to be even more, but it never came. So, uh, this is an excellent question. Lonamai says, We only got Beyond episodes for Prophecies. War in Kryta. Factions, Winds of Change. We're missing... T He's also forgetting about Hearts of Love. What was it called? Anyway, Hearts of the North, I think it was called. We're missing two other episodes for both Nightfall and Eye of the North. What were the original plans for those two? Why were they cut down? I don't know whether the Eye of the North one's legit to talk about, but... Nightfall, they definitely said they were going to do a campaign for Nightfall, and they never did in the end. Joe says this, that Mike Z might be able to answer better. I don't think Mike Z does answer here, unfortunately. This happens so much in this anime. Anyway, he says, By early designs, the Alonan chapter could have been about two plot threads, giving closure to the Marganites left behind, and Joko's conquest of Alona. An early idea was that, that was considered was to let players create an awakened character and serve Joko for a short campaign taking place between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 to avoid the issue of his conquest occurring many years after Guild Wars 1. I always wanted to let alone and players become Spear Marshal after Nightfall, but that's just my personal opinion. But, but I bet there's a lot of paperwork involved in the position though. I don't think there were any notable plans for an Eye of the North chapter apart from Hearts of the North. There you go, Joe, Joe got it right. So basically, I'm amazed by this because... I had always assumed that never ever, not in a million years, would we actually legit see uh, uh, a chapter about the rise of Palawa Joko. Because that happens in lore so much after Guild Wars 1. Our heroes, if they were still alive, would be withered old men and women by that point. 
Uh, so the idea that they didn't even care about that, they were going to find a workaround by doing almost a bonus mission pack style thing where you get to make a new character? Can you imagine if that had come into Guild Wars 1, making a new character, almost like a new race for that? That would be so exciting. I'm probably imagining it on a much more grand scale than they were actually thinking. But damn, and then the other side of this as well, giving closure to the, uh, the Marganites that were left behind. Now that is a badass story. That is something I really wanted to see a lot more of, even from Guild Wars 2, Path of Fire, Living World, and we've just had barely anything. We've had the Jackals and a little bit going on there, but the real closure to those Marganites after their god is, is, is disappeared, that would have been fantastic. Uh, shame we, we didn't see any of it in the end. I mean, a real, real shame. I wish that someone had asked about that meeting where they all got together and said, all right, the live team is no more. Uh, those are always the sad ones. Next, uh, we got a question about technical difficulties. Hey, a more fun question. When creating the expansions for Guild Wars 1 or even the base game, uh, but before Utopia and Guild Wars 2, was there anything you wanted to create but were unable to do due to technical difficulties? And if you could revisit Guild Wars 1 as a dev, do you think you'd be able to achieve it today? So Joe says, I mean, look at how much this guy responds here. So good. I wasn't joking at the start. Not exactly what you asked, but it took several failed attempts over a year or two at a hair stylist before I was able to get it working. Ditto for mercenary heroes, which seemed impossible until gradually the pieces came together. Those were two later features and I tend to forget about. Uh, next, we got a question about armor rating. This is going to sound like gobbledygook to Guild Wars 2 players, but bear with us. Pyra Spite says, I created the armor rating project on the wiki. I was able to record basically every hostile creature's armor ratings and add them to the NPC pages. I conquered Maliks and Ergos with seven heroes and barely doing anything helpful armor testing build twice. But I was never able to reach Kanaxi or Doom by myself. These are the only non-pre-searing major enemies without recorded armor ratings. I'd love to complete this project nine years later. So I ask... What are Canaxi and Doom's armor ratings to blunt, piercing, slashing, cold, earth, fire, and lightning damage? My other question is about a very odd skill interaction that I had to check many times to make sure I wasn't crazy. Gruel champions are one of two enemies that uses blood rage, a monster-only skill. The skill is odd not only because it appears to have no cooldown, despite a listed cooldown of 30 seconds, but it seems to lower Gruel champions' blunt armor by 30 when active. This isn't mentioned in the skill description, is a unique thing for a skill to do, and is almost unnoticeable since blood rage is almost always active. This is is especially odd since the other creature that uses it, the Gruul Demagogue, doesn't suffer from the armor reduction. Could someone look into this skill and tell us if it's working correctly? Are there two versions, one for champions and one for demagogues? If it is working correctly, why is it so weird? Oh, this is the good stuff, guys. Guild Wars 1 mechanics. Joe says, I did a little digging and reverse engineering. I can't say for sure what my, that my findings are 100% accurate, as there can always be missed scripts or buffs altering them, but my conclusions are... I mean, look at this. He even went and did this for this guy. Canuxi's armor matches Ergos's with bait 100 base and plus 30 to elemental damage. Doom has just 100 base armor in all categories. That might not be valid in hard mode. I suspect Canuxi and Ergos would gain more armor based on their level, but Doom does not. Blood Rage looks like it has a couple of bugs, like refreshing its own cooldown when it ends, but none of them touch armor. Demagogues and champions use the same version of the skill. I would not be surprised if it's increasing damage taken by the user, but that wouldn't be for a specific damage type. Dot, dot, dot. There you go. The mystery is resolved. And there were lots of really nice comments after that in the thread where people were like, wow, I can't believe that that's actually... Those edits exist on the wiki now and the project's complete. Good stuff. Uh, here's an interesting one. Maybe we've seen the conclusion too. I don't know. Just bear with me. Guild Wars 1 accessibility, sales or promotions. I hope this is appropriate to ask, but I've been hoping for an answer about the Guild Wars 1 current listings for a long time. Are there any plans on releasing an all-included package or even just an all-expansion package? I want to play this game, but prices are kind of confusing and not appealing for this game. Grey market is not even an option, obviously. And all the bunch of extras, the side stories, the com commodity slots, etc. are not totally clear for someone who's not informed. I think many, like me, would just want a Guild Wars 1 Complete Collection Edition or something like that. Are there any plans? I also think promoting the Hall of Monuments items that one could get or a good appeal if such promotions would go into Guild Wars 2 space. Yeah, oh, so excellent question. There's going to be a lot of you listening to me right now who, when I say Prophecies, Factions, Nightfall, Eye of the North, you're not really going to know what order, what came out in, and what's a campaign, what's an expansion, what you get in what bundle. 
and we take that for granted as vets of the franchise and the devs probably take that for granted but it probably does push a lot of people away there should be a complete collection for guild wars 1 rated at something like 20 quid that gives you everything and like some extra bank slots because honestly the quality of life these days it just feels so weird going back to the ga that game with how inventory works um maybe a single mercenary hero maybe your choice of some of the bonus mission pack stuff i don't know like doing that would be such a good promotion we did see the steam sale recently uh so here's the dev response mike said and i think this was his only response i think in the whole one the whole AFC. He says, an all-inclusive Guild Wars 1 offering? What an interesting idea, dot, dot, dot. Now, I don't know what that means. This was posted, I think, before the Steam sale. Which, obviously, they put effort into and did. Is that what he meant? The Steam sale? Was that an all-inclusive offering? I mean, it was all on Steam, but you still had to put separate things in your cart, didn't you? Uh, even if it was all discounted or bundled, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think that they'll do something more? I think there should be something more than just what they did on Steam before. Um, but there you go. I hope to see more effort on it. Maybe you guys have got some further ideas. Next, we have a special thanks. A couple of questions from Ogel. He says, about halfway down, I have two questions. What were your favorite things to create? And were there any plans to open other areas within maps, like the Isles of Janthir, Ebonhawk, the mountains south of Kaineng? If so or not, which areas do you think would be cool to see created in Guild Wars 1? Thanks so much. Uh, so Gail says, I didn't create anything, so I can't speak to that. Or maybe I did in an indirect way. Here's my story. It was two days before the launch of Factions which was launching on the one-year anniversary of Guild Wars Original. And the thought struck me, hey, we should do something nice to celebrate our first anniversary or our character's first birthday. So I walked up to Mike O's desk and told him I thought we should do something to recognize the momentous occasion. He looked at me for the longest time and I thought I'd really goofed because, come on, it's two days before we launch a new campaign and there I was coming up with something extra. Just as I was about to say, just kidding, and slink away, he calmly picked up a pencil and made a note and said, maybe we can. Mo took the idea and made it happen. He talked to Izzy Cartwright and they brainstormed the project to conceive of the anniversary slash birthday miniatures. I believe that Mo and Izzy worked on the implementation and sure enough, when our birthdays came around, everyone was surprised and delighted by their special gift. And I believe remains pleased to this day. So while I can't claim I did that, but I can sort of say I thought of doing that. Oh, and the Shamrock Ale on St. Patrick's Day. Boxes of chocolates on Valentine's Day. Pumpkin pie in the fall. John Hargrave created those in patient and kind response to my hey, could we requests. And those are all nice little aspects of Guild Wars 1 that we don't really see in Guild Wars 2. Uh, and yeah, birthday minis were fantastic. Uh, you Guild Wars 2 players will have some sense of it, but... The way that that was really the only place you'd get them during Guild Wars 1's heyday, trading mini, uh, minis like that, direct player to player trading, that feeling of tension as you double clicked, you only got one roll per year, did you get a rare mini, how much could you sell it for, how excited would you be, that was pretty thrilling stuff. That system reached a height that is, minis in Guild Wars 2 have never come anywhere remotely close to, uh, probably due to the fact many are just thrown out for no reason and sold on the gem store and invalidate in various ways, which we won't get into, but yeah. Yeah, damn, that's cool to hear the uh, inception of the mini story. I just want you guys to understand that that was a big deal in Guild Wars 1, and it's nice to see how it was really birthed. It's news to me, at least. Another response from Peter Freeze says, uh, My favorite part of map building for Guild Wars was setting up little pieces of environmental storytelling through set dressing, placing little props around in the Canthan Island village or remote Elonian desert settlement, and thinking about the lives of the people who might live there. I also really like blending environments, making transitions between snow fields to meadows, or between beach sand and jungle. That was much harder to do with our Guild Wars 1 map creation tools, though. This never got close to production, but Daniel had an amazing concept for a city in our shelved utopia campaign that would shift around like clock gears i would like to see how or if that could have been pulled off in our old engine that was a really famous concept piece of concept art i think award winning uh and maybe in fact i'll throw it on screen for you guys to look at here yeah interesting insights here and it's kind of interesting i guess because we know that one of the main things peter freeze did even on his most recent work was in corner doing environment design thinking about the lives of people who lived in that settlement there and stuff uh you know uh 13 years later or well, however long it was kurzik slash luxon border from pre on a rage the border in the factions campaign between luxons and kurzik's has been stuck for quite a while 
Being an avid Alliance Battles player, it bothers me that the border and consequently the Alliance Battle map has not changed in months, maybe not even over a year. My question concerns this border. I was wondering whether it would be possible to change the underlying system of the border to an automatically changing border that changes, for example, every three hours. This way, the Alliance Battle maps would alternate, making Alliance Battles more interesting. Furthermore, by continuously changing the border, smaller Lux and Guilds will be able to enjoy outpost perks as well. While nowadays, this is mainly a Kurzic privilege. The wiki states... So, this is a fascinating question. I'll give you the devs' response before I go off on my little rant about it. Uh, Lindsay says, as far as I know, the border is an extremely delicate system that only the original lead designer messed with. I would be very hesitant to have anyone do anything with them. It would be a scary amount of work just to learn how the system works. And SCW, who looked into it, he says, I was thinking of making the border move around based on smallest possible input from Alliance Battles, but I looked at the code. Lindsay is right. It's kind of confusing, so it's unlikely to change in the near future. This is actually a big topic. It's a bit like the random arenas, team arenas, Delta Moore arena thing. Uh, that format of the game, Alliance Battles, has lots of different battlefields. Vast, different maps with different visual themes and areas that you can travel around in. And the idea back in the game's heyday was players were at war with one another. The Luxons versus the Kurziks. And the more that the Kurziks won, the more that the maps would progress into Luxon territory. And the, the Kurziks would claim their land and until the, the Luxons got good enough to push them back. And it was based on players winning or losing. I guess what this is revealed to me now is that Kurzix won, guys. I mean, I didn't know this, but I guess Kurzix won. Kurzix were the better, better faction there. It seems that for at least a year, maybe, that map has just been stuck with Kurzix having all the terrain and people who like that game type are now just stuck on that one same map over and over and over. Despite the fact that Guild Wars 1 has so many different environs you could be battling in, it's only this one because the Kurziks were too good, I guess. Uh, yeah, it would be great to see that change, and it's really uh, disheartening to see that it won't be able to, I guess. Oh, well. Next, we have... What did the devs think of speed clear runs? In terms of Terra Perma Sins, Speed cleared the Underworld and the Fissure of Woe, as well as the Dungeon in Eye of the North. What did the devs think of this? Was it ever intended? Was there anyone desperate to get it nerfed or reinforced? The Assassin speed running community was always something I really enjoyed, and I always wondered to what extent the devs took notice of it. Lindsay says, oh, we noticed. We talked about it a lot, actually. The addition of Doom as the Underworld end boss was in part a response to speed clears. I was looking to slow them down without a lot of hard counters in the content or major balance changes to the classes. I figured adding new content would help mitigate the bit of a nerf it was getting. Ultimately, I think where our minds landed on things like speed clears, solo farms and other extreme methods of play is that if players enjoy it and it's not hurting anything, we should let them. That's a nice way for them to have fallen with it. It is funny looking back at Guild Wars 1 though. You did feel like the black sheep of the community when you were participating in this stuff. You never were sure whether the devs ever really approved. And it always did feel like you were just one nerf bat away. And that they were always frustrated if you ever skipped a single mob. In fact, even going to Guild Wars 2 design and original dungeon things when people skipped mobs. Most of the developments around dungeons felt like the devs angry that players weren't interacting with every little bit of content in almost you know a, a grumpy way i like the uh, eventual philosophy that Lindsay espouses here that apparently they had with guild wars one uh, and I, I remember that they did lots of things like this it wasn't just the addition of doom as a boss to the underworld even when they added the skeletons with one of the halloween updates before doom himself was added that again was just to slow down and counter farms but not completely eliminate them because there was there was something fun about it there's something fun about taking the game to an extreme level and being rewarded for it uh so there Next question. I would love to read your most memorable moments in Guild Wars. I think one of mine was full of player parties working together at the launch of the game. There was so much to do and explore. No one really knew what they were doing, but somehow we completed each mission one step at a time. I spent hours making builds and combining, combining classes. Yeah, that's a little snap, snapshot of MMOs and this franchise that I don't know whether we'll ever re really recreate. Uh, anyway, loads of people, even members of the community responded to this, but there were a few dev posts. This one here is one of the most interesting to me. Stephen Clark Wilson says, We were brainstorming ways to do better music implementation than just a rotating series of pieces in each map. Uh, Brandon, a programmer, made a system where I could put a circular zone in a game and blend from the main map music to a special piece. It turns out that was going to be a lot of work, so the system was used exactly once. I made a little video a long time ago showing the one place where this occurs. This is a personal video, not an ArenaNet one. Also, somewhat 
amusingly, there was a story step here before launch where you had to cleanse yourself before proceeding. You took off all your armor and you stepped into the fountain. The removal of your armor part was removed before launch. So I'm giving you guys this here and I'll play the video in a second. I have sh this, this video SEW is talking about is from 2011. And I remember finding this buried on YouTube in 2011 when it had something like 15 views. It was a very little known Guild Wars 1 Easter egg with 15 views on YouTube. And I pushed it out as hard as I can. I think as of making this video now today, it's up to 600 views. So there it is. And I'll show you guys it here again because it is one of those rare cool little things. Basically, it's a special system where music can change based on the very specific place you travel to. And here's how it looked and sounded. Next question uh, is about Raza. Raza always comes up. Hello, I was wondering if you could expand on his origin from development and law perspective. Was his birth exclusive to Nightfall? Is it possible there are other beings like him searching for their purpose, selling rare recipes, presumably lost? Uh, I think that's basically hinting at a Guild Wars 2 feature that was added recently. Joe says, hmm, I get the sense there you have some specific wanderer in mind. All manner of beings and circumstances could exist or occur in the mist, so I can't say if there are any others exactly like Raza, but it's interesting to wonder about. On a less law tied note, one of my proudest moments working on Guild Wars 1 was when we were finally able to let Raza change his class. That was a feature that was cut very late in Nightfall production when it became clear that heroes wouldn't be able to support it in the way they'd been implemented, but the instruction manual still claimed he could change his class. When we're in implementing mercenary heroes, I realized we could finally make the manual retroactively correct and seize the opportunity and that was a big moment obviously in the heyday of Guild Wars 1. Uh, not the heyday, the twilight years uh, of Guild Wars 1. Next question is about 6v6 Heroes Ascent and Heroes in Guild versus Guild and Heroes Ascent. Uh, hey folks, as most people know, PvP consists of a lot of hench teams, very few full eight-man groups. My questions, as the title says, are, is it possible to revert Heroes Ascent to the days of 6v6 to increase the number of teams that can be created with active players? And also, is it possible to allow players to once again bring heroes into one or both of the competitive modes to increase build variety and the amount of teams that could play? I'm looking forward to I'm looking for a way to increase the activity in these modes while also adding a little variety and customization over the normal henchway runs. I think that's a really cool idea. There's so few people in PvP you can do things like this, I think. Anyway, Lindsay says I was pretty heavily involved in the decision to go back to 8v8, and I was deeply involved in the Heroes Ascent community, both as a player and a dev. The move to 6v6 was not a popular one for a variety of reasons. This was a very small period that I vaguely remember. She says, ultimately, why we changed it back came down to game balance. The game was fundamentally balanced for four or eight players. Six was creating some weird stuff with builds. I think that argument is likely still a valid one, but I understand the desire to get this game type active again. I am willing to have a conversation with Izzy about it. He and I worked on 6v6 back in the day, but I'm not convinced it would be a healthy way to rebuild the game type. Now, she responds to that, and I think that's fair, and that's enough to quench my desires for 6v6. However... The, uh, what about the heroes? Bringing heroes back for players? That sounds like that could increase a lot of diversity, no? Hmm, I wonder what the original reasons for not allowing heroes there at all was. Uh, I mean, they could say heroes but limit only to three like the old system uh, instead of seven as we're now allowed. I don't know. Anyway, uh, next we get a lot on skill balancing. And Izzy, who's been mentioned a couple of times, now comes with some heavy walls of text. So, buckle up, guys. It comes from LXL, Ra LXL. How did the skill balancing work? I'm just talking about PvP right now. Mostly guild versus guilds. I know there used to be a team of players and some devs who would discuss skill changes. But I'd assume there would be many different ideologies about where the game had to move to. And it wouldn't always be visible for the devs what the motivation of the players was to their answers. For example, the rumor was that Raw used to convince people that escape melee rangers wouldn't be a problem to pick those builds in the monthly automated tournament and win it. 
uh, rumors and obviously people interested in the competitive elements of Guild Wars 2 will be more than familiar with this and there's so much crossover between the answers you're about to see for the two games. So they basically say how do you filter to who, who which person you'd listen to? Was there a set ideology about where the balance was meant to move to? Was the balancing more a flavor of the month thing? If you could go back in time what would you change would you change the way you used to balance skills? These are great questions and the direction of Guild Wars 2 balance is constantly on my mind about making cooldowns uh, faster uh, making more th more things more accessible more 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 i wonder whether that was the right direction to shift to who do they listen to about the sequel well here they're being very candid about the original game so izzy says story time so the way it worked was there's a group of people who internally talked about every balance change this always started with james finney and izzy me we made the final call on each change and discussed them in detail. Then we had a number of people who would join us from time to time to give insight or discuss changes. This group grew over time, but including a bunch of people, Lulu, Morello, Lindsay, Robert G, Chap, and I'm sure a bunch more that I'm forgetting. The meeting would always include a list of proposed changes. This list was generated by everyone, but I had editor rights in making the list. Collecting what goes on the list was a huge group effort by the above people and we would talk to fans, look at data, to watch tournament games play the game a lot we were always looking for different perspectives this process made me get really close to the top teams and i found a few players i had a lot of huge design debate with ensign is probably the player i debated the most with after a while of debating one-on-one -on -one via private messenger or in game i went rogue and made a forum on my personal website this started off as just an easier way for me to talk to a bunch of people i would debate balance with and sort of became a huge thing I started inviting people into this group that I felt could discuss balance and were good at the game. GVGs, Arena, PvE, Tombs, etc. But in hindsight, it was more focused on the GVG crowd because that was the area of the game that hit balance the hardest. After a while, I started posting the finalized list of changes that came out above the meeting and getting their thoughts and feedback on that list before it went live. This worked somewhat. I had a bunch of rampant leaks that took a while to track down and kick people out. <laughs> leaks, obviously, when this stuff happens. Turns out PvPers are a bunch of punks who knew love you all. <laughs> Overall, it helped to get a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints, but the end call for what changes did was always handled by one or two people and everyone else would provide data and insight. So to these specific questions... He says, how do you feel or who you'd listen to? Mostly they had to be good at the game and be able to have a good design debate with everyone else. Uh, number two, was there a set ideology about when balance was meant to move to? He says, we had a number of, ideo uh, of ideology we would use. Play was a huge one. We always tried to find ways to buff answers and counters to problem rather than nerf the problem. So when something came up, the question was, what is the counter was normally the first question. We would also try and make at least 20% of the skills were being used in top level play and that which 20% was rotating based on an active meta. I found these ratios to be pretty much universal for any healthy meta. I love that, by the way, this idea of uh, deliberately shuffling, shuffling a, mus uh, a meta for the sake of balance is something you see employed heavily by Blizzard and is notorious in some communities. Izzy with his 2020 rules seems interesting. Uh, question three was the balancing more of a flavor of the month thing he says yes and no sometimes we would push the meta one way and another in order to change which 20 percent of the skills were being used sometimes we were just focusing on making bad skills usable again and number four if you go back in time he says i would never added new classes to the game I would have just added new attribute lines. So instead of assassin, I would have added all those skills and attribute lines to warrior and necromancer. There was a huge debate around factions. I think we went in the sexier route of new classes, but it created an ever-growing issue of class balance, which in the end, I think made keeping an active, healthy meta an ever-growing complexity problem. This made us overlook huge issues with defense versus offense that eventually blew up on our face in a bad way and IQ showed us that shakes fist. Uh, so this is cool. If you guys were following me in 2014 as Heart of Thorns was coming out, you remember I had some interviews even with Izzy and I did talk about, he gave me this anecdote, this idea of just adding a new attribute line to the classes and how in many ways actually that's very similar to what they're doing with elite specializations. And you can kind of say elite specializations is then proper with an invigorated take going back to what could have been really good design for Guild Wars 1 when it came to their campaigns. Uh, the problem with that idea of just adding attribute lines is it's not flavorful it's not sexy it's not sellable 
But in Guild Wars 2, they butter it up as much as possible by giving you a new weapon and fancy new animations and blah, blah, blah. And so hopefully that's kind of the middle ground. And so, yeah, that was a big topic when HOT was coming out because elite specializations had just been revealed. And uh, yeah, I, I got that story back then. Anyway, the story does go on, uh, and it gets even slightly salty. I love that this is still true, even in Guild Wars 1, many years after development ceases uh, for balance. The community says this, Considering ArenaNet did massive buffs to Elementalists and Dervishes before stopping supporting Guild Wars, and left the game in a state where Guild vs Guild requires three monks, always at the main team, all awkwardly using the same non-overlapping skills from just two different attribute sets, smite nerfed completely out of the game, forcing a damage position to run flags, and that this meta-wide strategy is obviously different to how GVG was played during the rest of Guild Wars history, and seems obviously unintended and imbalanced, would ArenaNet ever be willing to offer any kind of solution at all for this problem? Another skill update, open sourcing the game, allowing players to help, uh, blah blah blah. Uh, so, Izzy says... As for the three monk issue, this was always something we were fighting with. The hard part is the higher damage goes, the less DPS you need to bring, so you go three months. So the way we normally handled this was keeping the number of characters you needed to do 600 damage in less than a second to four and a half. This made it so the third character wanted to be half damage, half support, or a solid runner. There were plenty of times we had three monks or even four monks. Eight monks cry, and it was a never-ending push to not do that. So it doesn't surprise me that when we put balance down, that this was where stuff landed. Also, uh, we found the higher skill players were the more they would find ways to get more damage from everyone, including their monks. As for are we open to more changes, I would never put anything off the table. <laughs> So, the last comment obviously doesn't really mean anything, but he gives us a bit of an insight there. As someone who's not actively trying to GVG through a bit, uh, a bit of an unfortunate meta, I, I'm not too upset here. But I can imagine feeling a bit unfulfilled on this. Uh, more questions. Did you ever feel betrayed by the people you trusted with balance decisions? Except for the obvious leaking of skills. The group of people you'd debate with was the test crew, right? I think I remember the name. It wasn't the test crew. He says, this was not the test crew. It was my own little group. After I left Guild Wars 1 and moved on to Guild Wars 2, the group started making this balance group a bit more official and merged it with our internal alpha group and then named them the test crew. The more popular we got as a company and as a game, the more leaks hurt us. And so the tighter we had to get in our internal groups and testing. Did I feel betrayed? Oh yeah, I don't deal with betrayal well. I'm sort of an eye for an a heart kind of guy. I wonder how the uh, teams felt about all those raid... I mean, re obviously they wouldn't have liked it, but really felt about those raid leaks a little while back when they outsourced the community for feedback again. Uh, also, we get another question, basically just about balance, and Izzy says, this is balance in a nutshell. Predict the future. The more possibilities, the harder it is to predict the future, and the biggest issue with doing it is we get in our own way, adding our own perspectives on what we want rather than what will happen. The only way to combat this is by collecting as many points of view as possible and use people's biases in your favor. The community responds by saying they felt like balance was too big and unwieldy later. Uh, Izzy says that yes, in the later years it could have been it due to the geometrically growing connections between skills as we added more new skills. I think this is what led us to remove secondary professions for Guild Wars 2, but in hindsight we didn't fix it, we just moved the problem around. I think Magic came up with a good solution that everyone has a sense copied, where they have a set of cards that rotates over time so the size of space you're working with doesn't grow to insane in complexity. I've been impressed with Dota and League of Legends ability to hold it together, but that's a debatable topic in its own right. That is an amazing Amazing comment from Izzy. Amazing. Let me just hold the phone here. One of the main reasons we were led to believe that so much design stuff happened in Guild Wars 2 was to combat was to stop this balance nightmare. The removal of secondary professions, the arcade style linking of five skills to a weapon, the forcing of a heal skill on you, the forcing of an elite skill on you, lowering uh, sorry, raising the minimum bar for how good a build can be, trying to hold things in check. And here we have in 2018, one of the devs saying we don't even think we really necessarily solved it, we've just moved around. And I agree, they didn't solve it. It is an insanely complicated situation Guild Wars 2's in. Far more complicated I'd even say than Guild Wars 1 ever was with so many traits firing so many different things and so many skills doing so many different things at the same time instead of just eight clearly defined easy to spot animation uh, slow to activate skills per player we have anywhere between 
30 to 40 skills per player that do any number of different things. Guild Wars 2 is wildly complicated. And so it's amazing to see a dev there. Really, this is buried in so many walls of text. Most people won't have read this far or really paid attention. That's an incredible thing for me to see. I, I mean, really, it is an incredible thing for me to see uh, based on all the discussion and conversation and efforts that went in as Guild Wars 2 came out. Uh, I mean, we've kind of known it for a while, but it's, it's cool to see it being appreciated even on the dev's end there. Uh, so yes, that idea as well of rotating just what is the current set. I actually think that is what if if Utopia had come out and Campaign Five, and we had just gone with Guild Wars One forevermore. Uh, I really do think that's what they would have ended up doing. Don't forget, it was heavily inspired by N MTG, and I think it would have followed it in that way as well. Uh, you've seen Hearthstone do some similar stuff as well, and I think that following that game's development is, in many ways, interesting to see how Guild Wars 1 probably would have gone in the end. Uh, so then we got another question. Uh, I felt that the balancing was often too much. On one side, the most used popular skills would get banned, and at the same time, a whole lot would just get buffed, making it blurry where the meta would be. And Izzy says, well, this is the goal of creating a new mayor. You want to blow up people's ideas of what it could be and create a chaotic moment that everyone needs to figure out. If you look at games like Path of Exile, they really excel well at creating this chaos to create a meta. Magic also does a great job by rotating. It says, I love what Izzy's saying here, guys, because Path of Exile, to me, is the heart and soul of Guild Wars 1 married to, like, a Diablo-style game. Get, part of, if you want a, a real, a, a closer sequel to the experience of Guild Wars 1 than Guild Wars 2 ever was, it's Path of Exile. And so it's so cool seeing Izzy has played and understands that game and sees how the two products diverged. Ah, it, it's so, so, so cool to see this. And then finally, down here, interesting, I don't play Guild Wars 2 myself, but is this is where Guild Wars 2 is going to? Instead of having the extra profession as a teaser for new expansion, new attribute lines? And, well, he says, Guild Wars 2 is a different beast. The issue with making good classes is you have to make them feel different. And the more of them are in, in the harder it is. In games like EverQuest and D Dark Age of Camelot did an amazing job of having a lot of cool classes. But games were harsher back then, and you could give classes ways to deal with that harshness and make a whole class work. For example, resurrection, corpse teleporting, fast travel. A lot of these things that made classes different now are default for everyone. So they push you to find different mechanics to make classes work. This is what makes adding new classes so hard. You have to find a hole in your game and fix it with a new class, and there isn't an endless number of equal size holes to fill a game. Yeah, I think that's interesting to see how quality of life refinements as games and MMOs in general have trended have affected class design. I've never in my life thought about that, but he, he's got to be right. You know, locking off resurrection to only the monk and ritualist class, not that Guild Wars 1 did that, but just assuming for a second, gives them a certain niche and avenue, while in Guild Wars 2, resurrection is just everyone pressing F. It's not even a skill, let alone something you invest in. Uh, so yeah, that, that affects class design. Interesting stuff. Now, I know I like to try and be exhaustive in these videos, Izzy has two full more pages of responses to the community. So, if you look on screen right now, here's one of them, which you're more than welcome to read. These are less interesting than the ones that I've read out, for what it's worth. Uh, and here's the other one you can see on screen now, too. And you guys can pause the video and read those if you like. The last message there, that last block of text about heal per second being stronger than damage per second in Guild Wars... Uh, is, is is kind of interesting, and I wonder how that matches up in Guild Wars 2. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. That's it. Now let's move on to some other topics. Here we've got someone who says, All right, everyone give me your favorite bugs. Uh, I think this was meant for the devs. A lot of the community started responding to this too. As is tradition for me to ask devs, I want to know what bugs you loved in the original game or hated or just in general silliness that you found within the code. Joe comes back and responds by saying there was a bug during the development of War in Kryta where the White Mantle, or the Bandit, Rangers had a special skill to summon their pet before the player showed up. An error in its script caused the rangers to use it over and over, resulting in a writhing carpet of ranger pets too dense to see the fields of Kryter beneath it. I think you could hear the server crying in pain from the sheer number of NPCs. <laughs> uh, a favourite that actually made it to the live servers for months, if not years after the release of Eye of the North, the Rebel Yell buff from the Vanguard ranks was bugged. It was supposed to give a bonus amount of adrenaline when you hit a char. Instead, it gave bonus adrenaline if you hit anyone, and and you were a char. This made the adrenaline gain effectively never work, except for brief moments when I was testing the bug with a gloriously effective dragon slash pyre fear shot build. Yeah, you might have scratched your head there. Wait, when could you become a char in Guild Wars 1? I guess your heroes, if they're a char, pyre fear shot, 
uh, they could get Rebel Yell. And I guess that means if you repped the title, then Pi would have... That's amazing. That's such a strange bug. I wonder if anyone had found that before the devs. Surely they did. Otherwise, how did it come to their attention? That's fantastic. Izzy has uh, a bug here as well. He says, Signet of Might. Uh, so he says, it once broke... And in, so this is a signet, by the way, you might be thinking of the Guild Wars 2 version. This is a ritualist signet. You cast it on a summon of yours and it turbocharges the summon, but guarantees the summon will die after a little while. And then you have to resummon it. Okay. So he says signet of Mike was bugged. And instead of only being castable on spirits, you could cast it on anything. So that made it so that after 10 seconds, any target you pick died. A whole me and that's funny enough, I guess. But then a whole meta game developed out of it, with players using ignorance and ice prison to counter it. Just a super odd, fun weekend where I had to scramble to fix it. I mean, that's the beauty of Guild Wars One skills, really, right? Like the, a meta, you can see this ridiculously overpowered-looking thing, and then a counter meta can be born. Ignorance being a mesmer skill that made it impo a hex. That while you were under the effects of ignorance, you couldn't use a signet. So you'd use ignorance to counter their signet of might. And I'm not sure what he means by ice prison. That was just a snare. Maybe he's thinking of another skill. Or was signet of might only usable in melee? I'm not sure. Anyway, there you go. Uh, next question. Hidden fun facts in Guild Wars 1. Game developers across the ages have hid different things in their games that take days, months, or even years before people find them. Uh, for example, the arena net symbol in the Guild Wars 2 PvP lobby, or the turkey room in the Ascalonian catacombs. Uh, do you have any hidden rooms or fun facts about Guild Wars 1 that you don't think people have found yet? What are your favorite hidden things in Guild Wars 1 that have been discovered? This is an interesting thought because it's been so well gone over this game. SCW has an amazing post. I won't give you the full thing. Uh, but here's the start of the body. He says, I've been asked a few times over the last six months about the direct song tokens and what they mean. So direct song, guys, is like a third. It's not really third party because it was produced by SCW, right? But it exists. It's, a, it's an engine that exists outside the game, I think, that plugged in bonus music that you could buy from other areas. So if you bought like the collector's edition of Nightfall, you would have bonus music that would play in that campaign. But the way that the engine knew to play it and whether you were eligible to listen was through this thing, Direct Song, okay? So I've been asked a few times about these tokens, what they mean. He says they are seven letter tokens that tell Direct Song what is going on in the game so it can find a playlist. I couldn't find any documentation on it except this text file from 2006. I did mild editing on it. I'm probably the person that wrote this summary in 2006. And as I look at it, I'm befuddled by what it means. If you have Direct Song installed, the information below might help you decode what it's trying to do you can edit the guildwars.ds file in a text editor if you're brave i wish i could be more help but it was a long time ago and back from the days when we compressed all knowledge into the smallest possible space for efficiency after all no monthly fee but still internet and server costs to pay hence very tight budgets for transferring data in this case, the tokens fit into a single 32-bit integer, which meant some of the letters mapped to the same number. Good luck. I feel like I'm posting more of a puzzle than actual answers. Uh, also, this looks like I only have had tokens through the faction's release. So he's got this huge post here, okay, uh, which just goes on and on and on, where he's given all these different tokens. There was a really cool community initiative over on the Guild Wars 1 subreddit recently where people were trying to compile the highest quality versions of every track that's ever been known to exist through Direct Song, through Guild Wars 1, through the festivals, and uh, find like a definitive way to play it all in-game. Really awesome, and I wonder whether this would have helped people a little bit. Be kind of fun. Uh, as for other hidden things, Matthew says, Haha, well, gosh, I've hidden a lot of tiny little things in my art over the years. The one thing I think no one ever found were more than a few buried references to Homestar Runner, Strong Bad, and especially Trogdor in some of the textures I created for Ascalon because I was watching that web series a lot during Prophecy's development. My biggest hidden secrets in the original game were the alphabets I began creating when I was working on Prophecies. These later got fleshed out into an actual system in Guild Wars 2, but for the bulk of Guild Wars 1, it was bit more of a hobby that I got to indulge in, save for Canther, which was the first official alphabet we actually shipped with factions. Uh, so yeah, Matthew doing a lot of that stuff he's talked many times about before, and if you follow him on Twitter, you can sometimes get fun little things from that. Izzy says, uh, a fun little hidden thing is that Masa is the words murder and Satan's mush together. I feel like the community already knew this, maybe? He says, I see dragon swords were me griefing a player named Cunts, who hacked a game to make a local item called the Icy Dragon Sword. Then he tried to make me trick players into going in farming ice imps and get nothing. But once he posted it, 
I quickly worked with the effects artist to make the item and then rushed it into the build to foil his grief. Worked super well. Next thing, he was up there farming the rare drop. I, we've heard this story as well before. I think my first time again was 2014. Uh, regrets. This is a cool thread. I want to see more regrets threads. Uh, it gets some reasonable response as well. Hi. First, thanks for taking time to host this AFC. As a Guild Wars veteran, it's made for some interesting, uh, some fascinating reading so far. So here's my first question. What are your Guild Wars 1 regrets? Content you wish had made it into the game but never did. Maybe content that did make it in but that it didn't work out as well as you'd hoped or expected. That sort of thing. So SCW says, on one of the back-end servers I was working on was the automated tournament server. We had hero battles, which were 1v1s. As Lindsay had said elsewhere, it was a bit of a broken game mode, which is why it's gone now. But when it first came out, it was reasonably busy. I'd written the AT server so it could support any size tournament. I wanted to have a special 1,024 person single elimination tournament. That's only 10 rounds of very short 1v1 matches. So it could have been doable. And there were enough active players to have it happen. So I set up such a tournament and tested it and everything worked great. Except the UI in the game was limited to drawing 32,000 pixels or some such. And the history of 10 rounds, 1,024 players far exceeded that. So, ultimately we couldn't run a tournament that big. Solely because of user interface. I think it would have been fun. I think the max tournament size we could do reliably 100% was 128 players. I think 256 worked sometimes, but it was right up against the limitations in the UI, so we avoided it for safety reasons. If there were more players than a single tournament could support, we could automatically run several concurrent ones instead. That's sad. Sad to think that that last little kink in a chain can break everything that works perfectly on the back end. Uh, Gail here says, as a player, I've always felt regretful about the whole concept of stealing one of Glint's eggs. Kind of a different take on the question, but, uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, Matthew here says, oh gosh, I'm regretful every time I pass one of my particularly ugly props in the original game. I know every asset helped make me a better artist, but some of the ones that made it to live, I'm less than proud of. <laughs> Lol. Uh, I wonder which exactly he's talking about be kind of interesting to see. Joe says the mercenary hero user interface is really programmer art looking and that's my bad. In a general sense there are any number of programming solutions that I wasn't happy with like the back end for fancy weapon effects seen in the decade set but at some point you have to stop polishing the code so that QA can confirm it works. To not have a thread entirely of remorse, here's a non-regret. Some of the henchmen added for the Codex Arena were based on cut characters from various bits of content I worked throughout the years. The stories won't ever be told, but they exist in the game now and I like to think it pays a little homage to the numerous designs and stories that by necessity are left on the cutting room floor. Nightfall being the first campaign I worked on, I was very excited to see Alona and particularly Vabby again. You know what? I would love to hear him just talk about each of those NPCs and what he remembers the cut content they came from was. That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Uh, Gail says, I just thought of something else too. If the Masat are truly gone, I regret that very deeply. And Bobby here. Bobby doesn't talk much in this AMA, but he did. I think this is the only post you'll see uh, on my video of it. He says, after Eye of the North shipped, I basically disconnected from Guild Wars 1 development to focus purely on Guild Wars 2. No big regrets there, though I wish I had been more aware of, of or mildly involved with developing Guild Wars 1 live updates during that time. Here's my tin hat. The tin foil hat speculation here, guys. It's because he's saying this, and this is a mild regret, because Canther is totally the next expansion, and so all the devs now have to brush up on their Winds of Change law. And Bobby was disconnected while Winds of Change was coming out. Boom, there you have it. Confirmed. Wood and potatoes, whatever the date this video is as it goes up. I'll see you guys with the next one. Uh, next question Saul D'Alessio travelled south to the island of Janthea mistake or oh I, I tell a lie Bobby responds to this so a well known weird lore discrepancy that we're unsure if it's unreliable narration or if it's a dev mistake so Mantle Knight Franklin in Guild Wars 1 said that Saul travelled south to Janthea while the mysterious isles lie north of Kryta there is however a Massart presence to the south the Ring of Fire Islands so here's my question, was going south unintended and Saul indeed travelled north to Janthea Isles or Ring of Fire was planned to be called Janthea Isles earlier in development and the idea was scrapped but the dialogue wasn't rewritten to acknowledge this? I, I like this question because this is such an old time long term thing, if we got clarification on it it'd be kind of cool. So Bobby responds, no doubt because he brushed up a lot on all of this stuff being one of the team on Bastion of the Penitent. And he says, it's been established that the islands actually lie to the north. So there are a few possibilities. 
Number one, Saul was exiled. He was dehydrated, starving when the Massart found him. In all honesty, the guy had no idea where he was by then, and he couldn't give accurate info to anyone upon his return. So Franklin was just relaying bad info. Two, there's a larger unexplored plot about the magical isles of Janthir that move in the night. Three, a writer made an error and wrote south instead of north. Or four, something I haven't thought of yet. I think the first is the most plausible, but I bet there are more interesting fan theories out there that could possibly be the re real truth. I've talked about this on numerous occasions, a mix of each of these. It's a shame we don't get anything definitive from the devs, or maybe that's what's fun, that we don't get anything definitive from the devs. There you go. Maybe one day in Guild Wars 2, we will get there. And wow, oh my god, I can't believe it. We've proper raced through there. That's it, that was the last question. Oh, I thought I had like one or two more. No, that's it. I would have uh, pointed that out there. So there you go, guys. An hour and 20 minutes on this one. Not quite as long as the most recent corner release. But that is a pretty goddamn big AFC. There is another one that I want to talk to you about. And there is a ton of dev information on streams and things. If I can get another video and talk to you about all of that, you'll be fully in the loop and caught up with what's going on with Guild Wars over these past very few frantic two to three months. So hopefully I'll be able to do that. But there you have it, guys. A bit of a glimpse, a bit of an insight. Look back at Guild Wars 1. Again, I'll restate what I said at the start. There's a lot of little times on this where the devs say, oh, I'll get this person to give an answer. I'll get this person to give an answer or I'll come back to this. And they don't. And that's a real shame. But nonetheless, some pretty juicy stuff there. I really think Joe did awesome. And especially Izzy even coming in just to talk about balance for a while. And what that could mean when you translate it to Guild Wars 2 uh, is super fun to see. So thanks, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, it's a shame we don't get comments from devs who aren't there anymore. I'm sure they've got plenty of stories too. Uh, maybe there could be a way to do that at some point. You know, Insomniac Games did an amazing developer Let's Play of the Ratchet and Clank series that was hosted by devs that didn't even work there anymore. So the thought that maybe we could get something like that from Guild Wars one day would be awesome. But we'll see. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you very shortly. A lot of you have been asking for the LP and don't worry, it will be there soon. Cheers.